Hello, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show where we talk about the hard things. I'm Toby Dore. In today's episode, we'll see just how much one woman can really make an impact in her community. Our guest today is Carla Anderson, a re-entry coordinator for a national nonprofit in D.C. In this position, she helps individuals, specifically women, transition successfully to their families after incarceration and to their community, helping them overcome and rise above the stigma that is attached to a formerly incarcerated person. As a former resident of Loudoun County, Virginia, Carla now resides in Frederick County, Virginia, with her life partner, Harold, and their rescue dog, Cardi. Hello, Carla. Thanks for Hello. joining us. There's, Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm really excited for our conversation today. But first, I have to say there is nothing better than a rescue dog, is there? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> they just make your life so much better every minute. Yes. So I like to ask all my guests a question that kind of gives us a peek into who you are. What's your favorite color? And what does that color say about you? Okay, my favorite color is orange. Oh, I and love orange. I'm not quite sure what it says about me. It's vibrant. Uh -huh. It it can match and go with just about anything. Yeah. Um I I I just have always loved that color. I have too. Orange was my favorite color as a child. And you know, everybody picks blue or red, but I went with orange. And now I really like pink and orange and purple. And they kind of all go together. I like to use them together, too. But yes. I, I think orange is a vibrant color, and I'm not surprised it's your favorite color at all. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us about a crossroads in your life that pushed you in a different direction? Well, I've always been a... Um an advocate, a community person. Mm -hmm. And while I worked on different projects, you know, sometimes you just don't feel that it is the right thing, but you know, it's, it's, it's not the right thing for you, but is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where I kind of, you know, was most of my life. And then through what I thought at the time were some unfortunate decisions that I made, I ended up doing, um, some time in a federal prison camp. And, and I say unfortunate at the time because it actually ended up being one of the best directions that I was put into. Um, so all that experience in community, all that, that knowledge of how to advocate definitely came into play, which is why I do what I do right now. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And that's valuable. You know, I, I also did some federal prison time. And I always say, you know, I found my freedom inside prison because there was nowhere else to go except to deal with my internal emotional issues and, and think about how to plan a happy future. So Absolutely. It, it is surprising how that works out sometimes. So tell us what a day as a reentry coordinator looks like. What is the most difficult thing for women reentering society to overcome? Well, first, let me say that there no day is this repeat itself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't. I was thinking maybe I should say a week or a month, but <laughs> <laughs> but one of there are so many obstacles that women um, that are returning home encounter. But one of the biggest problems is they don't believe in themselves. Um, they society has a way of just like tearing you down. And if you aren't strong in your belief that you can make it, mm -hmm. then it's going to just like snowball. And so I know that these women have it within themselves to, to make it through and transition successfully to their families, to their community. But, you know, coming home is, is a little scary, mm -hmm. um, especially for those um, individuals and those women that have been gone for 5, 10, 15 years. It is, a, a mindset change shift. Mm -hmm. It is, it is just everything um, to get used to. And a lot of people in society don't realize that. So they think, oh, they're free and life is going to be mm -hmm. okay. And that's not the way that it is. That's and so true. I think 
the most difficult thing is to change the women's mindset and let them know that they can make it. They can Mm -hmm. overcome whatever, you know, is thrown at them. Yeah. You know, I think as women, we are, are, we can be our own worst enemies. We hold ourselves accountable for things we should never even be accountable for, like the weather. You know, I find myself sometimes in the past apologizing for the weather as if I had control over it. You know, (laughs) it, we just need to learn to let go of things that aren't ours to, to own. And I think that's difficult. So Carla is also a co-vice president of Alfred Street Baptist Church Jail and Prison Ministry Program. So tell us about that ministry program. What, what kinds of activities do you do in that, in that uh, organization? So, um, like many, I'm sure, uh, ministries within various churches, um, you know, it is a subset of the larger church. And we um, take the gospel and we go into the Alexandria Adult Detention Center as well as the Alexandria Juvenile Detention Center and help them realize the opportunity that the power of God can help change their life. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, it has made a difference in my life, that's for sure, mm-hmm. and, and I'm sure in others. But that is our really, our big mission um, at Alfred Street mm-hmm. Jail and Prison Ministry. That is beautiful. You know, when I was in federal prison, we had a group of women come in from a particular church, and I don't even remember what church it was, but they would come in a couple of times a year, and they would bring in um, hairdressers to give us real haircuts. And then while you were getting a haircut, one of the ladies from the church would rub lotion on your hands and do a hand massage while you were getting a haircut. And I remember that made us feel human. You know, it made us feel so important and it was just so good for the soul. So there's a lot of ways to minister that, you know, are outside of traditional ministry. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's beautiful. And, you know, I've learned that Carla doesn't do anything lightly. She is also a justice ambassador with the Prison Fellowship in Lansdale, Virginia. So that's three organizations she works (laughs) in trying to help people coming out of prison. So tell us about that program and its mission. I am actually honored to be a part of Prison Fellowship. Um, It is is an organization that while I was away, I read and and wanted to be a part of right from the beginning. And it's it's in my back door. But basically, I mean, they do a number of things. But as a justice ambassador, one of our biggest goals is to um, have build relationships with our state legislators and trying to help them understand and advance reform. And, you know, when you're trying to tackle that elephant bite Mm -hmm. by bite, Mm -hmm. we know that you and I understand that policy and law is one form of that. And and it's an important part of that, um, especially so they can hear from someone with lived experience. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love that title, Justice Ambassador. I, I think that is such a noble calling. And uh, I might like to get involved with that, actually. I just think, yeah, I think that is so cool. And, you know, there are so many laws that aren't even realistic. And I think it's good to, you know, have a voice and bring a voice to that from someone who's experienced the other side of it. It makes it a lot more powerful. So, there's tremendous value around re-entry because it isn't just the returning citizens who benefit from a successful trans- transition. We all benefit from that. Nobody wins if someone reoffends and has to go back to prison. So what are the biggest benefits of these re-entry programs and what are the biggest needs that are the most difficult to meet from a re-entry standpoint? I believe, um, wow, there, there's so much that mm-hmm. you can you can talk about. <laughs> um, one of the biggest uh, needs, um, I think, globally um, is housing. 
Um, we have a lot of uh, people returning home that have been incarcerated for a number of years and perhaps their family isn't, you know, there in the same places when they were leaving. So housing is a really, really big issue. Mm -hmm. um, and employment. Um, I would, I, I often invite employers to change their mindset a bit and realize that every institution is really manned and, and run by the residents. Um, you know, for example, the warehouses, the plumbing, mm -hmm. the landscaping, and those are uh, skill sets that can be used out here. So, mm -hmm. you know, with many employers, if they would just change their mindset a little bit, instead of thinking it's this violent person coming to invade mm -hmm. their space, that these are people that really just want to get back into with their mm -hmm. families. They just want to get on with their life. And, and they really are probably a little more dedicated and loyal because they have a goal. They have often mm -hmm. restitution. They have probation that they're not going to stray from that job. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, those are the two biggest things mm -hmm. that I really would like to advocate for. I do agree with you because it is so easy on the surface as an employer to say, well, it just doesn't make sense to hire someone who's been to prison because they're, we already know their trouble. They've proven that they've done something not trustworthy. But you're right. Those people are more grateful for a job and more determined. They have something really hanging over their head if they don't Definitely. perform well. So, you know, actually they could be a better resource, a smarter resource, if you just looked at it from that different perspective. Exactly. And, you know, the Board of Prisons um, during COVID came out with a statistic that during the COVID, the pandemic, when they were releasing people, they released at 1.6 thousand people. And at the time that they released their their results, only 17 had reoffended. And that's 17. 17. One seven out of 6,000. That, Absolutely. That hardly, you can't even hardly get a percentage on that small of a number. Yeah. Absolutely. People don't really, truly, they don't want to go back to prison. And no. most people learn something while they're in prison and they get out and they want to change their ways, have a better life. So, Absolutely. yeah, I love that statistic. Uh, if someone listening wants to get involved with their local reentry efforts and they're not in the D.C. area, which you're familiar with, where would you suggest people start to look to find a way that they can make a difference in their community? Um, and, you know, it's it, it varies from state to state. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I would ask to, you know, suggest to someone is Google reentry services mm -hmm. um, and see if that's not a place that you can volunteer. But with even without even doing that, um, I suggest I would think that if you don't have those resources in your area and you're an employer, certainly go to your local jail or mm -hmm. prison and and ask, is there a way that you can perhaps employ some of their people when they're re when they come out? Oh, that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Church projects and things like that. Perhaps you put a goodie bag together mm -hmm. with you know, full size products because, and I say right. full size because so many times people will give you a sample size and that doesn't last. It doesn't long. last long at all. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think so. people realize how important some products are in prison. It, it's not like, you know, I always was pampered myself with really nice shampoo and conditioner. And in prison, I found if you could afford to buy the suave off the commissary, you were really rocking it. I mean, that was high quality. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just amazing how grateful inmates can be when, they, when they're able to get something that's, you know, what they can't get otherwise. Exactly. And, you know, one of the things that I, at some point, I have a goal to do is for many women, when they come home, it seems small, but offering them pajamas. Oh, what um, a great idea. So many yeah. years uh -huh. you have had to not have pajamas. Mm -hmm. And what a good way to let you know that you're no longer incarcerated is to be able to lay down at night, be peaceful in pajamas. I love that idea, Carla. I love it. 
I am going to think about doing something around that. I just think that's a beautiful idea. Well, I would love to help you. Yes, I think it could be a fun project. I think it could be a really fun project. So are any of the organizations you're involved with looking for volunteers right now? Is there we a need? are, and, and, and um, many of them in various ways at various times need sometimes more volunteers than others. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just invite anyone to contact me and depending on the need at the time, because the one thing that I never want to do is have someone that wants to give their time, which is so very precious. And uh -huh. then we not, we'd be in a slow period and they're not able to do anything. Um, many times if you can mentor someone and uh -huh. mentoring comes in so many forms, uh -huh. um, we are having, we're having, we're seeing a shift in people with the new laws and people are coming home and they're at a different phase in their life. They might've mm -hmm. gone into prison when they were 18, 19, 20, and they're coming home now 20 years later mm -hmm. in their forties and fifties. Well, learning how to use a cell phone, yes. um, learn technology like zoom. Mm -hmm. Those are soft skills that anyone can, you know, sometimes we need volunteers to help do that, mm -hmm. but you know, those small little things. So I would just invite anyone to, you know, feel free to, um, email me. And we'll and, include um, your contact information in our show notes. So people will okay. be able to get hold of you. Exactly. And then at the time, just let me know what you're interested in. We try to match people with their interest with, you know, the the, the right thing because re-entry is, has, it's a myriad of things. Uh -huh. Yes, it is. And people, I think, getting out of prison just kind of cherish a connection with someone that they feel can help guide them through this because... Absolutely. You know, when I was in prison, I made really close connections, probably closer than I've ever made with anyone, with some of those women inside. And when you come out, it's a whole different world. And you just feel like you have to start over with your relationships. And having someone in your corner, I think, would be such a value. Absolutely. And and I think you and I had touched on it briefly. One of the policy changes that I think we should all work toward is the fact that this person or sometimes people that you perhaps went through your darkest moments with mm -hmm. that you trust, when you come home, you can't contact them. That's right. So That's right. you are left to fend and retrust and just kind of blindly go at it. And I think that's very unfair, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, that it, it's just not feasible for your mental health. I so agree. And I would like to see that changed as well so that you can still reach out and get that support that you developed while you were in prison because it really can be a game changer. Right. And I think that's a mindset change because everyone, again, thinks the worst. Instead mm -hmm. of thinking that you're moving forward to productivity, mm -hmm. they think you're moving and conspiring to reoffend, And yes. that couldn't be farther from the truth. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's really not what the majority of people getting out of prison have in their mind. They really Absolutely. do want to get out and stay out and make a change. And we should give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I, yes. it would make yes. a big difference. I love that idea. And we have second chance month coming up in April. So everyone can can take their time and kind of dip their toe in the volunteering. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. I love hearing that. Uh, I'm sure that you see tremendous highs and some devastating lows in your work. How do you handle the lows without losing faith? And how do the highs fill your soul? Well, one, I never lose faith. That is one thing that I learned while uh -huh. away. Faith is what got me to where I am. Uh -huh. Faith helped me transition and knowing that even when I was told no, there was going to be another opportunity. So that I don't lose. But there are some times when I feel like I want to save the world. Uh -huh. It breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. when someone comes to me and I know they've been trying and they're still told no. Mm -hmm. 
And so I just sit down and listen to them and then try to leave that exactly where it is. And that's at work. Um, I live, if anybody knows um, about Winchester, um, you go over this big mountain and then, you know, to get to the town. Mm -hmm. So as I come from work, I leave everybody at one side of the mountain. (laughs) Once I go over the mountain, I'm at home. But then when I go back to work, I pick them up at the the mountain. So (laughs) that is a great way to do that. That really is a great way to use that mountain. I love it. Right. I love it. So I think about them all the way till I get to the foot of the mountain and I work things out and then I'm like, okay, I'll leave y'all here. And yeah. Go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So what's one question you wish I had asked you that I didn't ask? Is there something else you'd like to share with us? No, I, I think you have done a great job. Um, and it's always great to be interviewed or talk to someone that has had that lived experience uh-huh. with you. Yes. Um, uh, because I don't think many times people get to the meat of what is needed. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of times people interview and they want to know what you did and yes. that sort of yes. thing. And that's not, not, that's not it. That's not going to help us try to get the BOP to talk to the DOC to yes. <laughs> talk yes. to the DOJ. Right. None of that's going to help. And And I just appreciate so much that we were able to get to the conversation and what's really needed to help people return. Because Mm -hmm. after all, when you incarcerate a woman, you impact so much more than just that family. That is so true. You um, affect a school system Mm -hmm. when the child is no longer participating. Mm -hmm. You affect the community when... Perhaps the grandmother is keeping them and the grandmother passes away and now they're in social services. Mm -hmm. So there's so much more when you incarcerate a woman. And I'm just grateful that you opened it up so we can talk about it. Well, that's great. I love it. And Carla, I'm so glad that our paths have crossed. And I know we're going to be doing a lot of stuff together. So, yes, because you're my kind of person. And in (laughs) fact, I really think we look alike, don't you? Yes. We have the big glasses and the short gray hair. (laughs) People might not be able to tell us apart once we get going. (laughs) Yes. Well, thank you so much, Carla, for being on. I'm sure that our conversation is going to make a difference. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Remember, none of us is our worst mistake. We all have so much more to offer the world. And those so-called mistakes are blessed opportunities to learn and grow. Next week, we'll continue to bring you inspiring stories by people who've identified a need for change and are working to make a difference in the world. Subscribe to our Patreon channel, Fierce Conversations, for special access and behind-the-scenes info. Go to patreon.com slash fierce conversations or click on the link in the show notes. 10% of the Patreon proceeds are dedicated to providing workbooks to women in prison. The show notes will also provide links for you to contact Carla directly and a link to purchase my memoir, Living with Conviction. As I talk about in my memoir, I had a conversation while in prison where my friend Lisa told me, in here, we can talk about the hard things. In fact, I think we must. And so we shall. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby, where we talk about the hard things. Until next time.